We'll get started. I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. Um, I was Jack, uh, born and raised uh, up in Arvada, came to Fort Lewis College 40 years ago and uh, never left. And if you're on my Facebook page, anybody know where Cow Rock is right outside of Fair Play? Can you drive down? You see the cow? I stopped, climbed the fence, jumped on the cow, and took my picture on it over the weekend. So make sure you know that if you're, you're true Coloradan, if you know where that's at. But, uh, I'm going to start with Dave, this Dave, Dave Muller, and have him introduce himself and tell us a little bit about him. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So who are you? So my name is Dave Muller. I own Durango River Trippers Adventure Tours, as you heard. Uh, I moved here in 2001. Uh, did not necessarily have my eyes set on Fort Lewis College, but ended up graduating at Fort Lewis College. Um, became a raft guide in 2005 and loved that industry ever since and had the opportunity to purchase the company, one of the companies here in town in 2013. My other job behind the scenes that kind of helped afford all that is I was the general manager at Office Depot for 15 years here in Durango. That's what kind of uh, kept the bills uh, rolling during that transition. Um, and it's a notable work experience in what sector of tourism industry are you speaking about? So outdoor recreation, obviously. So that's that's kind of my vein. And in addition to rafting, we also work with the National Park Service Mesa Verde, and we work with the tribe. We work with about seven governmental agencies between the Forest Service and different bureau and BLM agencies throughout three states, which is where my company operates: Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado. That's me. Hi. Well, again, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Tori Osula. I am the general manager here at the Strader. I've been with this property for five years now. I moved here from Vermont about 16 years ago. My husband is fifth generation from Durango and he wasn't going anywhere. So, um, but I really cut my teeth in tourism and hospitality in the ski industry. I was head of marketing for the Vermont Ski Association for eight years. Uh, I have also worked for receptive tour operators, and that's how Lisa and I know each other. I was putting together a little craft brew tour through Colorado at one point. Um, and then I ended up here at the Strader, and uh, it's been history ever since, literally. Um, living and breathing in this very iconic historic building in town has elevated uh, myself, my profession, and uh, definitely introduced me to a lot of amazing people in this community that put their heart and soul into our tourism economy. Um, and I'm really lucky to be sitting next to this caliber of crew, as these guys uh, definitely have taught me a thing or two over the years. Hi, I'm Dave Rathbun. I'm the general manager of Purgatory in a little ski area called Hesperus, just outside of town, um, and the uh, largest snowcat skiing operation in Colorado. I've been uh, in the ski business my whole career. Um, I believe this is my eighth mountain that I've been affiliated with. Um, I was in Colorado previously when I worked for Intro West um, at Copper Mountain and Winter Park Resort. Um, and I have come most recently from Lake Tahoe. And prior to that, I was up in Oregon for quite a few years. So I've uh, been seeing a lot of how the industry has changed from one end of the, the country to the other. I was started my career in Vermont, went back, met Tori during my second stint back in Vermont. Um, so seeing all the changes has been pretty, pretty crazy. Um, I've lived in Breckenridge. Um, hello, Lucy. Um, and uh, I've lived in Truckee, California, Bend, Oregon, uh, and now Durango, Colorado. So um, pretty interesting things. Very interesting to see the size and scope of communities change over time. And a lot of it has to do with everything that the folks in this room do. So. Happy to be here. Dave Woodruff, uh, I'm the general manager of El Moro Spirits and Tavern, uh, 945 Main Avenue. Expect to see you all there after. <laughs> um, and also, I've been the Durango chapter president of the Colorado Restaurant Association for going on eight years now. Um, so, I moved to Durango in 2005. Um, I started my culinary career uh, slinging pizzas and beers at the old schoolhouse. If you've never been, uh, you should uh, give it a shot. And then I worked for he wasn't there yet, but I was uh, at um, the Bears Den. I was making all the ski school kids' food uh, back in the winter of 2005. So um, I present, um, I represent like more of a move, more boots on the ground approach about restaurants and what people are are, are facing. Um, I've been at El Moro since day one. El Moro's been uh, around since July of 2013. 
Uh, before that, I was part of Steamworks Marine Company where I started as a bouncer and a busser, worked my way up to be assistant GM of that establishment um, over the course of eight years. So um, again, I represent more of a, you know, where, where people are coming from, um, approach to how, um, you know, how the restaurants play into the greater scope of a community like this one. Um, I don't know if I've ever really been a part of um, this. I kind of forced my way in um, to these conversations. Um, I was on the marketing committee uh, with, with Visit Durango um, when the previous executive director was here, Frank, um, and then trying to keep, keep you know, restaurants uh, a part of this vibrant economy, especially through the pandemic. That was a, a big challenge, and I'm sure we're gonna go over a lot of what those challenges were. But, um, but yeah, it's been uh, an interesting, um, 17 years in Durango. I met my wife. Uh, she went to Fort Lewis College, um, and then we have, you know, six-year-old and eight-year-old now, and you know, love calling Durango home. Me. Uh, my name is Brian Lundstrom. I am the director of sales at Sky U Casino Resort. I have about 20 years of experience now in this uh, industry, mostly um, in sales and in hotel rooms. This is my first casino. I've been there for seven years. Prior to that, I was in Houston for six years. Prior to that, Seattle for four years. And then prior to that, in New Mexico, working for Hyatt on my house. So I, uh, I've been kind of all over the place. Um, very similar to Dave, kind of boots on ground. I, past president of the chamber, current vice chair of Visit Durango. Um, really trying to just make sure I can make my impact wherever I can and help out in any way possible um, with my time. So, uh, let's see here, sector, industry. Industry I'll be speaking about, I probably more hotel than casino. I have just more experience with that. Um, although the casino world is very interesting and, and there's some different dynamics that we have going on there. but. Um, not very uh, knowledgeable in food and beverage in comparison to this guy, but we've got a few restaurants there that I can speak on, but uh, my, my experience is mostly in hotel group sales, event sales, so. Well, thank you guys. Um, my background real quick, when I graduated Fort Lewis, I was a morning drive DJ, uh, did advertising sales, went to television at the local CBS affiliate for 12 years, worked my way up to station manager. Um, Albuquerque bought the station, got rid of the newscast. I shifted from there back to radio for a year as a general sales manager in uh, Clear Channel in Farmington. Worked at Fort Lewis College, corporate fundraiser and athletics for seven years, and then this job as a chamber director for 15. So our chamber focuses a lot on the marketing and helping to promote businesses. And again, we're not the tourism office, but we have Rachel and her wonderful folks to help with that. So. Um, we're going to dive in. You guys know what the questions are. We're just going to go down this list. I will let the panel answer. If you don't have anything to add to the that <coughs> wants to answer first, just, you know, do the old I agree. Kind of like we have to do at city council meetings. And we'll move on and get through the uh, all the questions since we have a short time. So the first one is, what positions do you employ at your business and which roles are easiest to hire and keep right now and which are the most challenging? Okay, next question. <laughs> yeah. uh, I can jump right in. So we have, so there's, interestingly enough in my business, there's there's kind of three facets. We have sales, we have operations, and we have the river. And when that unpacks itself, we have everything from, uh, we have welders, CDL drivers, bus drivers, raft guides, four by four guides. We have our 1099, which includes human resources, attorneys, and you know, we started in a kiosk with a calculator right across the street from here. So it's been quite a ride uh, to see the business grow. Um, easy, I mean, we had somebody today, no call, no show. I mean, so I think we've all experienced that. Um, and raft guides are probably the easier ones to hire for because they invest in their own training. So in the guide world, they pay to go to learn how to become a raft guide. It's a state certified program. Once you're a raft guide, you're a raft guide forever. And we work with the CPW to facilitate that from one of the instructors. So it, they pay us to go through guide school. Now that said, we subsidize the heck out of it. This year was 195 bucks. It should be 700, and they get 100 of that back if they make it till the end of the year, the season in, in July. So we invest them in right away. So 
we actually had to start turning away wrapped guide applicants during our second guide school. So that was a pretty easy one. We keep our CDL drivers close throughout the winter, and we usually can tap into the school districts for that. Um, but I would say the hardest one to hire for it right now is our sales position, something that can do reservations, well, back up, something that can show up to work, get <laughs> the telephones, and you know, build the right package and take reservations for the guests. Yeah, we are a mighty little package on the corner of Main and 7th. We have our three restaurant outlets, we have a banquet uh, program, we have an 88 room hotel, and so we hire for all of those positions, front and back of house. I would say right now, um, the no call, no show thing is very real and alive for us, and so when that happens, uh, we have about a total of about 100 staff here at the Strader in total terms. Now, when I first started here five years ago, we had a payroll of 150 people. So COVID certainly helped us to recognize some efficiency in our operation. We also uh, ended a 58 year lease with a 200 seat theater that was right next door to us, the Henry Strader Theater. So through that, um, we certainly can downsize, but I would say about 115 to 120 people would be ideal for us right now during our peak busy season. When we have a call out or a no show, then it's all hands on deck to try to fill that gap. And uh, that has been a real challenge for us all summer long. Luckily, I have a fantastic group of managers who are willing, just like myself, to roll our sleeves up and be here when the time is needed. So, um, but you know, housekeeping and front desk right now seem to be my two biggest challenge points. Although in April, if you'd asked me in April, I would have told you back of house kitchen and uh, front of house servers. So, you know, right now the restaurants seem to be operating okay, <laughs> and now the hotel is adding a, a little bit of a challenge for us, but it, it's sort of like this all summer long. Uh, Corey's on set of duty this morning, I can imagine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll so, it's, it's what we do. Um, as an independent property, I don't have the luxury of just picking up the phone and calling, you know, Marriott or Hilton to say, hey, <laughs> help. Um, we have to do it all ourselves, and if it doesn't get done, then we don't generate the revenue, so that's where we're at. So I know I was at lunch earlier at another establishment, not here, and somebody at our table said, wow, did you have to grow the lettuce? Because it took a while to get our food. And she said, would you like me to get an application for you? We're, we're hiring servers, we could use your help. So it's uh, very challenging. Yeah, Dave, too. <laughs> yeah, so we're, you know, we're a full service resort. So in the winter, we should, we should have 900 employees, uh, of which about 130 are year round. Um, we have, uh, this past winter was the worst, worse than the prior winter. Uh, we only got to about 680 employees, so obviously some things suffered. So uh, this summer we're actually seeing things continue to be bad. We're 26 miles right from this spot up to the mountain, so a lot of people use the excuse that, you know, I just can't afford to drive back and forth. So. Um, our focus is to change a bunch of different things. We're calling it a new era of hiring and a new era of um, recruitment, hiring, and training um, up at Purgatory because we are not a, as big a community as some of the other communities that have the big ski resorts. Um, obviously, I'm sure we're going to talk about housing. Housing does not exist up near the mountain unless you're in a several million dollar home or condominium. So we are really struggling at this point to find enough of anybody. Um, there are certainly some areas that are tougher than others, um, skilled line cooks. Um, but typically the things that are certified, if you're in the ski business and you love that lifestyle and you are a true professional, I'll use a lift mechanic as an example. Lift mechanics in our industry are really, really hard to come by. This is the best setup I've ever inherited. Um, we are full. We have two lift electricians and we have 11 lift mechanics, which is unheard of in the industry right now. It's because they've always taken care of the professional people. And that's kind of what we're seeing is if you have a certification and just like you were saying, Dave, we invest heavily in getting people certified and showing them that the path to their long-term success is continuing to add value and getting these certifications it's very clear what you get rewarded with with that type of approach so we're basically taking that same mentality and applying it to every position but we're no longer calling you a server or a lift operator or a ticket seller 
you're a resort employee and we're trying to cross train people and then have enough people so when they do call out because it is it's insane I've never seen anything like it um, we've got at least some people that we can move people around um, so it's an entirely different world and uh, I would say three or four years from now it's not going to look at all like it did before the pandemic in our industry um, so I can answer that uh, question you know wearing two different hats you know from my own uh, restaurants perspective um, you know right now dishwashers um, are really hard to come by you know when everybody's paying 15 16 an hour ah that job sucks I'm just gonna go to the next one um, and then additionally um, this is something I've never really had a, an issue with is front of house managers um, I've had probably a lot of turnover with four front of house manager positions that have been turned over over the past um, probably year, year and a half. Um, and there's no direct correlation to each one. It's been its own individual reason for, for both, for all of them. Um, and so that's been really challenging because it's not like you can just train up somebody to wash dishes or train somebody up to be a server. No, they have to be able to jump into any position at any point in time, regardless of the level of business. And so that's been really challenging to try to get them trained up. It's probably a pretty extensive three to four to five month process to get them from starting through the hiring process and then all the way to be able to, you know, be fully autonomous. Um, so that's been uh, super challenging, you know, and especially when we get to, you know, more high end concepts, um, you know, beyond just fast casual, we have to make sure that we're hiring the right people for the right job. You know, what's the adage? Hire right, train right, treat right. Um, that's how you, you know, keep employees. And so, for us, it's been super challenging to find the right people because I can't just hire, you know, oh, well, you got a pulse and I hold the mirror up to your nose and, and you're alive so I can hire you. Well, it only takes one person to, to you know, ruin the whole deck of cards. So we have to make sure that we hire the right people and that's been super challenging. I'm gonna give a real quick plug for you, Dave. He was actually the Chamber's 2020 Volunteer of the Year. Mm -hmm. Every morning at four in the morning, you get an email from him that recounted everything about pandemic both on a state level national level it's like getting the morning newspaper and just all the things that you provided during that time so um you know, again kudos to you and everything that you did to help with you know the rest of the community to navigate through that so um brian uh just kind of reiterating what dave number two over there said about <laughs> Perk. uh you know pre-pandemic we had 450 employees uh, post pandemic we're at about 225 mm -hmm. so um, and that and we're hiring everything so we've got everything from room attendants to restaurant uh, servers bussers dishwashers slot tech attendants slot managers everything that goes along with the casino floor as well so um, what makes that difficult is we used to be a 24-hour operation we are now to where we're closing everything down uh, you know right around midnight one o'clock on Fridays Saturdays um, sometimes we'll switch it up you know during March Madness uh, national championship game was on Monday so we went ahead and stayed open until um, I think 2 a.m. that day but like, we're having to adjust regularly um, bowling we, we have a bowling alley our bowling center just adjusted their hours again based on the needs we used to have uh, the, um, the league bowling on Wednesdays, that just ended. So we shifted to where we don't have Wednesdays open anymore and we took on a different day. So just trying to shift everything around, um, hiring's just, it's tough right now. And, and like Dave three said, uh, making sure you get the right person in because if you don't, it just costs you so much more time and money um, than if you just struggle through until you do get the right person. So that's kind of where we are with it. Um, it's exhausting. Time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and along that line, you guys talk about like certifications. Um, I'm actually skipping down to kind of combine a couple questions if you're following along. But you know, we the increased wages you're having to do, adding um, hiring bonuses, creating any other type of incentives, not only for hiring but also for retention. So, what things have worked for you and what hasn't? And we're starting with Brian. That's fine with me. Uh, none of that's working. Uh, <laughs> increasing wages doesn't, nobody cares about that. 
adding uh, hiring bonuses, nobody cares about that. We're offering three thousand uh, dollars bonus right now for housekeepers. They don't care. Uh, wow. Other incentives for hiring. Uh, the one in so one thing that we've got going for us is we give eight weeks paid vacation. So you get automatically four weeks paid as soon as you come on. By year five, you got eight weeks paid vacation. Our benefits are incredible out there um, as far as health care and things like that. Nobody cares. The thing that matters <laughs> right now is, is having that work-life balance. That's one thing that came out in the pandemic. And um, something that we've noticed is you've got wealth famine, so people who aren't making enough money, but then there's also time famine. And so with that time famine, you've got a lot of people, and myself included, who go and they sit down and they're like, all right, I just wanna relax. I don't wanna think about work anymore. I don't wanna think about anything that goes along with that. And we'll sit down and watch Netflix or whatever. And you're not necessarily doing anything that's making you happy. You're doing something that is taking you and just relaxing. And so in order to try and get into a better place in your mind to go to work, we need to focus something along the lines of doing what makes you happy. And so in, in saying that, one thing that we've started looking at is character-based um, strategies. So what do you enjoy doing in life? How can we translate that into uh, work so that when you come to work, you're happy? And when you're at work, you're happy to be there. It doesn't matter if you're working a four hour day or a 16 hour day, at the end of the day, you leave with a smile on your face. And so that's something that we're trying to figure out. We're looking at gig work right now. So we're gonna pay you based on whatever this job is, whether it's um, cleaning the floors of the entire casino, you get $500 for that job, whether it takes you three weeks or it takes you a week, whatever it is, or, or two hours. It, it is what it is that we're paying you for that job. So that's something else we're looking at doing um, that, that seems to be having some sort of an impact on, on getting people in the business. Do you talk to your employees about what motivates them, what their you know, yeah, interests right now, are? Right now, a large portion of it. So for, with, with going from 450 employees to 225 employees, and Tori can attest to this, our housekeepers are working six days a week, 10 hour days. They don't care about money anymore. They want time off. Money does not matter. And we're, and we're losing them because we can't give them the time off. Now we had directors in certain positions that they made sure they got their, five, their, their two days off, but they were still having their employees work the six days. And that's not right. And so going and talking to the employees, trying to figure out, hey, what, what is meaningful to you? You know, another thing that was brought up actually today, right before this meeting, was um, health incentive bonuses. You know, give them a five hundred dollar gift card or whatever to do whatever they want with, and it's like a bonus at the end of the day. Well, that doesn't do anything for them if if they can't go and use it. And so, just trying to figure that stuff out and talking to them. Yeah, what makes what makes you happy? What do you do outside of here? And you know, a couple of my employees, I. Uh, I've bought them gift certificates to whatever um, up here at uh, at um, Del Moro <laughs> <laughs> to the to the hot springs and things River like that um, in River Trippers, yeah. <laughs> so you know, just trying to make sure whatever hobbies they they do, we're investing in those as well, and that's helpful. But money, this stuff, none of that, none of that helps. The the wage increases, it. It's helpful to a point, but it doesn't change your morale and, and things like that. You're happy for a minute, but that fleeting, that happiness is fleeting. So, who else? Yeah, you know, I, I jump right onto that. I mean, I'm sure Dave uh, too has the same thing. You know, it's nothing worked. I mean, it, it still isn't working. You know, we, we've done everything. We even like gave our employees like, hey. Give us an employee that stays on for two weeks and we'll give you an extra 400 bucks. Yeah. That didn't even work. <laughs> um, so it's it's kind of crazy. And, and so what, what we're seeing, you know, I was talking to a, a larger restaurant here in town and, and they're saying that we have people that are leaving for the summer, which is the best time to be in Durango because they can't afford it here. 
You know, so if housing isn't a part of the first part of every conversation we have about employee retention, then we're we're doing ourselves a disservice. I'm sure it's it's going on in all your communities as well. If you're not talking about housing, then what are we even doing here? Um, and I think that's probably the biggest turning point. And it's not a tomorrow solution. We're still talking five, ten years down the foot in the road before any sort of headroads can be made. But we have to start something now. So yeah, I guess I would just say um, we are seeing some positive things. The, the wage is an issue if you have not been keeping up with the market. Um, and again, I talk to a few of these guys frequently because we seem to, we've got a little inside joke here. We, we pass a lot of line cooks around in this town. Um, they, they flame out at one of our establishments, they end up um, at, at another one. Uh, we've even done it with executive chefs, I hate to admit, but uh, yeah, I've got one your executive chefs. Um, but it's coming down to what I, I've spent a lot of time on this myself in the last year because we did all of the, the typical things short term. Like we did everything based on a retention bonus and you sticking it out. We've completely blown up and started with this summer uh, what I'm calling a new era wage plan. And it is designed to do everything we needed to do as a resort, but it rewards specific behavior with really significant incentives. So you come as a new hire, you start at a base. If you're a rehire and you've been here um, more than two years, you get a bump. You've been here more than four years you get another bump are you willing to be cross-trained are you willing to work full-time are you willing to work more than full-time every one of those things you say yes to will get you an additional financial incentive and i am meeting with all these people myself in the summer it's only only we should have 250 employees i think we just cracked 200 the other day um, so we're still way behind we have two of our current restaurants that we would like to be open with now that are closed. Um, and we're just trying to run all our attractions. Um, that's the highest priority in a ski area. Um, but now we're into this whole world of, we've taken care of you pay-wise, it's proven. You know, We've just given on average, people returning for the summer, 11.5% wage increases over what we have already grown, which was pushing 15% since the pandemic it's radically different than what these folks were making just a couple of years ago and yet we still struggle so now we're into this whole knowing your your market we're 25 miles from town we had a carpool incentive we just blew that up and made it incredibly lucrative and people are coming up to me now shaking my hand saying thank you so much we have people that drive from as far away as aztec new mexico it's 125 miles round trip. We are gonna pay those people $30 a day to load their car up with at least one person. And then if they load it up with two people, they'll get $35. And if they load it up with another person, they'll get $40. So we're, we're basically looking at what I call non-financial compensation. It's still paying you for a certain behavior at work, but we've gotta get more people to say, hey, I, I can go to work at Purgatory now because they're paying for my gas and they're making it worth my while. We're even giving the carpoolie, the person riding in the car, a spiff. So hopefully these things, it's gonna take a while to see if it actually will work, but at least the current employees are recognizing it and recognizing that we are doing everything we humanly can to try to improve the situation for them and make it as um, you know, get them back to thinking about why you work at a ski area in the first place, which is, I value this lifestyle, I value this experience, and by the way, I get to work here. So if we can get back to that, there's hope for us, but the housing is still a major obstacle. And I agree with everything that each one of these guys have said. Uh, you know, one thing that I find here, we sort of have, have like a little accordion effect here at the Straders. So while we are running the hotel at 90 to 95% occupancy each month right now during the busy season, the restaurants are still doing this, right? So if we have a bus group in-house, 
restaurants are busy. We have breakfast service that starts at 5.30 a.m. for those groups. We've got uh, slow times, right? So everybody's sort of stilling around. You know, we staff up for those busy times and then we have to uh, cut them early because we don't have the business. And so they are finding it challenging. They, the employees, are finding it challenging to actually make a living that way, right? Because we're being so accordion-like with that. So we try to find them other things to do uh, to keep them on the clock so that they can make the wage that they need to make to live here in this community. Um, we give gas cards to our employees who are commuting um, that do not live in Colorado that are commuting from New Mexico. Um, my furthest is from Shiprock, so that's a four hour commute every single day. The woman gets up and leaves her house at 4 a.m works here until five o'clock at night and then turns around and then wow. does it again the next day. So, oh, you know, I mean, you can imagine with the cost of gas right now, I mean, that's a hardship for her. So we're helping her out as well. Um, and some of our other staff members are in the same situation. And um, the hiring bonuses did not work for us as it's been exhibited here. We have some really long-term employees. So we felt like that would be a slap in the face to those staff members who have been here with us for 10 years, nine years. Um, to all of a sudden have this new kid on the block making an extra 400 bucks or whatever that was going to look like. So we just raised everybody's wage here and brought it up. Uh, our, our starting wage for any position here in the Strader is $15 an hour, and then it just goes from there. And that was what we felt was the best. We also, I tap into my partners uh, for incentives for our employees. So stand up paddleboard rentals and day trips to Purgatory for the attractions and restaurant gift cards for El Moro um, and bowling nights at the casino. And we try to get those exchanges, that trade exchanged here so that we have those little prizes for our staff members who show up seven days in a row for work or <laughs> whatever that looks like, right? So everything is being rewarded now. I can echo a lot of that. Uh, I like that you ended on the trade part because she did, she'll do a trade for paddle boards and in exchange for gift cards because I don't we don't need the cash. And then I'll take that gift card and then I'll let my team take that gift card out to go out and have a night on us. So it's definitely it, it just stays within us. We did a lot. I mean, I, I heard on a ton of stuff. So first thing is um, wage. Uh, we did a thirty five percent increase wage increase over last year and across our entire company. Um, $15 an hour starting wage, which was very difficult for us to try to manage when you had guides that were, you know, very certified. But now our, our highest wage is $25 an hour, and that is still a tipped position. And that person's probably making 40 bucks an hour by the time they factor in their gratuity. So they're doing really well in that sense. Um, a little different for us, though. I mean, I like to think of my company on the wrapping side and the adventure side of it, at least instead of the, the other side, the noise. Uh, it's like working at Disneyland. I mean, I can hop on a boat, I can go rafting, I can grab a jeep, I can go four by fouring. So my, my, I get a lot of folks that are like, I don't need the money, I just want to be active. Or I want, I've retired in Durango and I want to do something three days a week so I'm not bored. Uh, and then I have a whole different group of, you know, I have people literally living in my parking lot out of their cars and vans and I know that I can rely on them when somebody knows shows because I can just go knock on the door. <laughs> <laughs> There's an idea. That is like the only advantage to that. <laughs> <laughs> and I do get 24-7 night security. So that's all. Turn our warehouse into some help. Uh, we could definitely do that. Yeah. Um, but everybody in this room has felt that. So when it's through price increase. So when wages go up, I don't, contrary to what some might say, prices go up. I can tell you for sure we increased our prices 35% to go rafting in order for us to accommodate the higher wage increase. Uh, can I, I'll just, then I'll throw one thing in there. The, the way we're viewing it, because we're such a big employer, so we, we underspend what we planned on spending on labor at the ski area last year by over a million dollars. So we took half that, and that's where we're putting it into. I just said, you know what, we're gonna budget like we're gonna have enough people, but I know we're not. So let's put a bunch of money into these non-financial things. So we have we budgeted half a million dollars of that million in the hopes that we'll close the gap a little, but we're still going to have to do all of these things um, that really have not been a factor in a, in a lot of years, if ever. Yeah, we did that too. Um, I think that's a really good point. I took our operations budget. That's usually, I mean, we're, we're not half a million, so $50,000 operations budget. We cut that down to 10, and we reinvested the 40 into our team um, to see if that has a payoff. So if I can run gear for five years, um, 
maybe if we did a trade off for labor, then maybe that same team member will come back year after year after year. So this is kind of our first trial on that. So as you guys are out looking for people, I know at the chamber we, oh, question. I'm just curious, how much did this community rely on J-1 visas pre um, the administration change? And is that a factor? I had 60 of them signed up and then we got a call last, it was probably last August. Hey, we're really sorry, but Vail Resorts just gobbled up all of the visa uh, people that you were trying to get. So we, we were lucky to get, I think we ended up with 26, but we ended up firing that particular firm and going out with <laughs> yeah. other firms. Um, so we're piecing it together now. We only use them, uh, we tried to get a few for this summer, but we were still having issues, but we're shooting for 60 next year because I'm guessing we're only gonna get 40. So, so, here's, the deal. <laughs> so, yeah. so here's the deal with J1s, you have to provide housing, right? Yeah. Why would we bring somebody in and provide housing for them, but not the people that live here? Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a kind of a man. What are we doing if we're if we're not trying to provide? If we're not going to pay housing for people that have lived here in this community for years. Why are we going to bring somebody else in and have to provide housing for them? The only place that we could potentially have housing would be at the fort. You know, and that's only for two and a half months, maybe. And they're living in dorms. You know, and then that's our season goes for six months. Yeah. You know, in our high season. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm again fortunate because our I don't manage this property, but we have a 77 room property here in town that our owner uh, owns, and we've just converted um, I want to say three of the big kind of kind of storage rooms into what I would call bunk houses. So we have 132 pillows now for the winter. Wow. So that's where we've been putting our J ones in the actual hotel rooms in the winter. Now we're going to have enough for 132 throughout that property. So we're we're the exception, you know, to be able to yeah. draw on something like that. Is there any interest on your owner? I mean, you've got property. Is there any interest on them in developing more uh, workforce housing on your property? I've got a six million dollar capital budget this this summer for regular projects. I can't find people, so I can spend the money. You know, there's yeah. people here are building high-end luxury yeah. residential units. Um, and they're good to do it. Yeah, they're you know yeah. something's going to have to change for that kind of thing to come back. The challenge we have as well is we don't have that kind of real estate up by the mountain. That's the problem. So we could do some more stuff down here in town, and we could get partners to do it. We could partner with the city or the county. But again, that's not going to directly benefit us. We've partnered with um, some, some. I don't know if I want to call it, I don't even think it's workforce housing. It's more for really disadvantaged people, Asparo Apartments. Our company, we donated $100,000 to that just because we believe in it. So we're willing to put our money where our mouth is. It's just we got nothing to develop up at the mountain unless you want to develop, you know, a million dollar house or condo. And then we don't have a residential college campus near us. So I'm curious, is that a talent pool? Because I think all of us that live in a small town think that there is this talent pool if you lived in a university town that you could pull from. They can't afford to stay during the summer season and the college won't let them stay in their dorm rooms. They can't stay here, so they move on. In the summer, we do pretty well in the winter. I mean, we have a program where Again, just marketing 101 here. We come in as a freshman, so they, the Ford will use this as a recruitment tool as well as you get a free season pass as a freshman. After that, come work for us and we'll give you another free season pass. So it's been working pretty well. We get about 500 kids take advantage every year of their freshman free pass, and then we'll probably get 200 of them. We'll come back, they usually are uber part-time like if we can get 10 days a year out of them, that would be a lot. Um, but at least we have that. So going to the next question, um, talked a little bit, are there other incentives? Are there programs, websites, fairs? And we used those saying earlier, uh, workable. When we were recruiting and looking for employee at the chamber, and it worked very well using that program. Do you guys 
find anything else that's working such as one of those? Or, no, you know, not for us. <laughs> I've learned one thing in the last four years, and this came out of California, because when we were there, we were the little guy, and we were getting hammered by the, the big guys. So um, we had an HR director who came from a different um, industry, and she just suggested, you know what, with mo especially with the younger group of people nowadays, you can't assume they're going to do anything. So the first thing we did is we started saying, would you like an HR specialist to call you? Which is entirely burdensome for an HR team that is usually too small, but it works. So we get most of our things that turn into a real prospect for us. They're asking us to call them and then we call them. That seems to be the only thing I can say that I've learned in four or five years that seems to work pretty consistently. This is our first year we did Indeed, and I got 90% of my sales and operations team off of Indeed yep. this year, first time. I did job fairs, I did Craigslist, I did postings. Indeed's the best. The local yes. paper. Local paper. Last mm -hmm. We did the two, there's Portless College hiring fair, we usually get one or two, and then there's the county one, but. The sandwich board out on the sidewalks at you know, job fair today, um, mm -hmm. have walk-ins, and out of the handful of people that walk in, maybe one, maybe two candidates, but really right now, Indeed's where it's at for us as well. And uh, we've tried everything from the Colorado Restaurant Association job board to the Fort Lewis job board to the, you know, name the job boards and fairs and papers that we've advertised in. It's a, it just doesn't work. It's just hard to find some of those entry level positions off of a website, you know? It's, it's a news point earlier, but like, the rules have changed, you know? like. You have to, you have to, you almost have to have like a, a really good standing, uh, you know, uh, whatever entity within the community for get, to get people. You know, like, hey, should I go apply here? Oh, don't go apply there. You know, <laughs> or be like, oh, dude, those guys are awesome. So you almost have to have like do all this legwork going into it just to be able to get people to come in through the front door, which is, it's I've never quite seen anything. We do have a refer a friend program. I think I'm sure today. No, you're so just, that we give incentive, you know, financial incentive. So we figure if we've hired you, you must have good friends. <laughs> we trust you. Bring your friends in, and we give them a financial incentive for that program. Yeah, our, and again, one other thing we've learned is if I put the screws to everybody, um, it's like bring your kid to work. <laughs> and, uh, just like I, how old they are. The, yeah, well, they do have to be a certain age for certain things. But, and then again. I got my wife. My wife's been a ski instructor and a ski coach forever. I've got her helping by loading lifts this summer, so she's a trooper. And yeah, she's working muscle. She says she hasn't worked before loading alpine slide cars. My husband's part of our maintenance team. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's good. I, so one thing I'll throw out, like as consultants, and you guys probably already do this, but you know, a number of businesses. Um, in Iraq have been really successful with profit sharing restaurants. I know Jay Beckerman, if you know Jay, he, he opened a new restaurant and hired 93 people and like our jaws dropped, like nobody can, you know, but he worked out profit sharing. I think it's a different kind of retention because then you have skin in the game, right? It's just not paying for the hour, but paying for the success of the business. And I think for anybody that you know can find a way to do just work for every business, but it is on his people are loyal. It's great. you know, and more businesses are trying to figure out how they how they can do that. So, so us at the casino, we have a six percent profit share. We do, yeah. So we that's part of your benefits that you automatically get. They'll automatically put six percent of your salary wage into a 401k for you without any matching at that point. And then on top of that, we'll match another 4%. So that's how we do our profit sharing. So, but to go back to what we were saying a few minutes ago, and Tori's hurt, she's probably gonna be saying this way too many times, but um, pre-pandemic, the, the rate of retirement in the nation, you've heard me say this way too many times too, I'm sure. I'll turn my hearing aids off. <laughs> but pre-pandemic, um, the, the rate of retirement in this nation was 3.5 million per year, generally. 2020, we hit 7 million. 2021 was another 7 million. On top of that, you had um, mothers and fathers leave the workforce because there was no 
childcare available. Those families learned how to live off of one salary and many of them never came back into the workforce. Currently, so that's 11 million right there, 11.5 million that just left the workforce. On top of that, right now, we have somewhere right around 11, 11 and a half million job postings available. We only have six million applicants nationwide. So if you take that number, if you have 100 people, we only actually have about 43 applicants for every 100 jobs that are available. And when you look at that, how many of them are skilled workers? How many are looking into hospitality? How many, you know, and you break that down and you really have to, there's so few people applying for these jobs that we're having to get creative on how we are doing business in general. That 11 million jobs that are available are going to shrink and it's gonna be out of necessity. So us having 20 different types of crackers on the shelf at the grocery store, that's gonna go away because those jobs aren't going to be there. Only the strongest are gonna survive in that situation. And that's the same way, whether it's restaurants, hotels, everything else, only the strongest and the best employers are going to survive. You're going to see that over the next five years. You're going to see a lot of businesses fold because they weren't good at taking care of their employees or because they just couldn't compete with the larger employers that have the money to keep people there. So Plata County is at 2.9% unemployment, which is pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the U.S. average uh, is 3.6% unemployment. So almost there, but when you're when you're talking about that smaller percentage, man, it's really hard to find skilled, qualified employees at any any level. So through Peak Food and Beverage, does they have um, El Moro, Steamworks, and Homeless, and you guys have um, employee owned? Does that help to keep the retention? Are you seeing that? Yeah, it's, it's part of that, that pitch, you know, when people come into the workforce. And so to go back to like the employee ownership piece. And so I think right now we have about 40% ownership is of, of our total um, company is employee owned. Um, so um, it's, it's good for the people that do have that uh, employment. And then we also provide people opportunities. If you've been there a year um, and you're in management, We'll actually finance a share. There's a finite amount of shares available. People can purchase shares, and you, that's how you get into the, the profit sharing aspect of it. And um, and it's something that's tangible. You know, you can sell that share to somebody else for X amount of dollars, whatever that rate is. Um, and so that's been helpful. Um, but you know, for some people, are like I'm just getting, I'm just washing dishes, man. I'm not gonna you know buy. You know, and we thought about like if we get over a twenty thousand dollar day. Do we share those profits? You know, once we get past a certain threshold, do we just now start, you know, letting some of that cascade down to some of the employees? And um, we thought about a little bit of everything, but I'll tell you right now, um, Tori and Dave can can tell you, the restaurant game isn't you're not making money hand over fist. You know, the national average for take home is three to six percent. So meaning ninety four to ninety seven percent of of all the revenue that you come in goes back into the food the people or the, the the supplies or the rent or whatever the case may be. So it's not like we're just scooping away thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. <laughs> when we made all of our entry level, you know, positions go to $16 an hour, that money's gotta come up somewhere. And you know, when we talked about price increases, we, you start looking at price elasticity. What are you willing to pay for a hamburger? Well, if you're not willing to pay 22 bucks for a hamburger, you're just gonna go down there and pay 19. So there's only so much that you can charge and raise your prices where people are like, I'm not gonna pay that. Right. I don't care what kind of experience it is, I'm just not gonna pay it. So you have to be really, really cognizant of what you're doing and how do you raise, there's all these theories about labor modeling and guest check averages um, to be able to, to kind of find that, that, that sweet spot, but it's a, it's a pretty uh, nice edge that you're walking through. What's interesting for us is a little bit about kind of coming out of this COVID with PPP money. You know, we were given, you know, PPP to essentially keep your workforce, to keep your pay, to keep your team. And we as employers were really creative on how we could keep our team around. And I saw that a lot, obviously, in the restaurant industry, to keep your team. There was an incentive. There was cash incentive. Keep your team. Keep your team. 
And now coming out of that, obviously the PPP is not there, you'd use it to invest. Now we're really starting to see is how can you really do less or do more with less? You know, it's everybody here is probably could say that we're short staffed in some capacity or another. And so we're figuring out ways to optimize our business. I mean, I was in, in Denver a couple of weeks ago and went to just a little tiny McDonald's. I flew in late, flight canceled, needed to eat, 24 seven McDonald's. There was no counter. And we see that now across. It was just straight up order from the app or from the <coughs> thing. So that's an example of some of these uh, larger corporations figuring out that they're just gonna put the help in with the team and back and not have front facing staff. Can I do that without, you know, rafting without a raft guide? No. <laughs> you can try. I took all the tracks down the end. Sure, it's just about But I tell you where we put a lot of our energy in that is online booking. So instead of having to have a staff over here running our kiosk, we have invested a ton in online conversions. And that starts to pay off so you don't have to have somebody on the phone for 30, 40 minutes taking a reservation. To go with what Dave Three was saying, I. Uh, <laughs> A lot of people don't. A lot of people outside of the the restaurant industry don't realize this, but there's there's a it's called downward spiral. So you have a restaurant that's not doing well or not making enough money, so you cut the quality of your product, right? And so you cut the quality of your product, and then uh, you get less patrons, right? And less patrons ends up meaning less money again. So you cut your quality again. And you just go down this downward spiral, and then eventually you go out of business. Mm -hmm. And it's because you're trying to keep up without raising your prices and you just you can't do it so yeah i'll play off that one i mean we we have been a pro at that i mean it's part of the makeup of being in the ski industry is you just you plug the holes when they they form and we we've now consciously as a management team have, have said we're not doing that any longer um, so for instance on a busy day we'll have nine restaurants we should have nine restaurants open at the resort uh, we're no longer going to pull from a restaurant that's fully staffed to plug a hole in one that's not because all we do is we end up pulling everybody down. So um, that was a really hard thing for a team that kind of has grown up and understood what it meant to work in the ski resort business and that's just what you've always done. Can't do it anymore. So that's one of the reasons why we've got two restaurants right now closed because those two restaurants are not fully staffed but the kitchen leads and the front of house leads in the, the restaurants that are fully staffed, they're gonna reap the reward and they're building a culture again for that outlet. That's just something that we're gonna to have to go through that pain, I think, for a little while. So along that line, with what are you hearing are the biggest barriers from your employees? I'm gonna guess, I mean, raise of hands, how many have really high cost of living or housing in their communities? Um, I don't know, we were experiencing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so housing, uh, child care, what are the things you guys are hearing uh, are the biggest uh, obstacles that your employees are facing? It's housing, housing, housing. I got one of my employees that can't find a place to live, so he's living in a hotel, and he's paying 2800 bucks a month to live in a hotel. That's a cheap hotel. So, I mean, that's just one singular example of many. You know, I've got one, one of my dishwashers, you know, she's got four or five kids. It took her a year and a half to find- Just to um, get child care. Just, yeah, but no, just, just to try to get into, she was living in her car. Yeah. And, and I was doing everything I could to try to help her out. And it took her a year and a half to finally uh, be able to get into affordable house where she's only paying like three, four hundred bucks a month for three bedrooms. But it took that long for that, that situation just to arise. So to me, it's like, it's not even quality of life, like not quality of life, but cost of living, it's it's all housing. You know, it's, it's it's about if it's available, and then if it is available, well, pardon my French, but shit, if you're paying 2,400 bucks for a two or three bedroom, that's not that's not sustainable. Yeah. Do you have a lot of people here who are using up your housing and working remotely? Yeah. Oh, that, that was yeah. that's what we saw from the pandemic. Yeah. That's what that's what caused you know all of our home prices to shoot up. And second homeowners that put their houses on the VRBO market, right. and that's an issue too. Um, yeah, it's, it's eating up all of our rental property around here. My wife, my wife works for a company here in town, but she's remote, and they want to have everybody go back to work, but her argument is even here in town like how can i 
have all of my employees go back to work when the cost of fuel is so high and they're way more efficient working from home. So even, even those people who are here working remotely out of state, it'd be, it'd be so difficult to get them to go back to work at this point. You know, it, it, I don't, with the cost of everything, I don't know how. I don't see it as much on our end. I don't, I, it's interesting because, you know, I do get a lot of folks in, that work from the school district, from Aztec and Farmington and Cortez, you know, some of the surrounding markets around here with an hour drive. So um, they actually get paid more per hour driving, like for my CDLs working for me than they do for the school districts. Now that being said, they don't get health benefits from, they don't need it because they get it from the school district. So one of the bigger housing challenges that we probably start to face isn't that my guide, my river manager is making 25 bucks an hour and getting tipped. It's that his work is seasonal. And so when it comes time to apply for his first condo um, and works at Purgatory, there's a gap in employment between the time that he leaves me and the time that he comes back to work for Purgatory or, or the train, for example. And so one of the ways that I'm trying to close that gap throughout our community partners is, is, is to not let them be looked at as seasonal employees, but to be looked at as year-round employees and that there could be other organizations that step in, nonprofit within the community that could essentially vouch for those six weeks in between and say this person is going to show they're going to they're going to make their payment they got the down payment and they can they can afford to this they can still afford to buy a two bedroom two bath condo in Durango if one comes on the market um, and make their mortgage with a roommate and get a little creative it's just their issue is that they're classified as seasonal and that that means they're not eligible or as eligible for a loan to buy a home in this area now as far as finding rents or roommates, I mean, I, I again, my situation is different. I mean, I have three of my guides right now are camping in the forest, and they come in from, from out of state, and they come in, they work they work the rafting circuit. When they're done with me, they'll, they'll head out on the East Coast, or they might go to South America. Um, so it's it's a little different for us. And that flies from a rafting guide. You expect your rafting guide to be a little stinky, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Work yeah. when you're a server. Yeah. 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 you got to do the 9 a.m. raft trip so you can take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Um, multifamily housing. You know, uh, we live in the Metro Denver area, area, and everywhere you look, there's multifamily housing being built. I mean, on top of each other. And, you know, to the builders, that's some of the most profitable building that they can build. And why doesn't that happen as much in the mountain towns? Is it because they don't want it? There are no builders here. I mean, they're all, we're all fighting. Anybody that has a project that's more than 2,000 square feet, there's like two contractors in all of this region. And their main office is in Grand Junction. So there's just not that infrastructure here. I mean, I've got a, luckily I got a road construction crew that also does a lot of work at the ski area. But when they're paving, I can't get them. We can't touch them. You need, you know, Dave talked about that earlier. You need real estate. You need, you you need the land hurt. to yeah. be able to, to build some of those larger footprints. That land is being used to build multi-million dollar homes. Yeah. Well, the, the, and again, those lots are very different. What you need is North Main. What you need is to do the, re, you know, go back and look at the infill in some of these areas that it more where the services are so you don't have people where you've got a, a huge parking lots and, you got so public transit you, down you, you here. You need them to live close to town because mm -hmm. if they're living on the outskirts, even 20 miles away, it's a struggle. Yeah. It's also allowing more vertical, um, you know, height restrictions, three stories, <laughs> four, you know, and you need to go. There's a lot of restriction that this community yes. has as well and that makes it challenging as well. Yeah. I think we have one of the tall, or maybe the tallest building at Purgatory. I think it's seven stories. Yeah. Yes. And that that did not meet the code in Durango back when it was built not that long ago. I mean, yeah, it's just... We're kind of a victim of our own uh, regulations and some of the things that the city council or um, county have put on. It's also running infrastructure, you know, a little bit further out. Where do you want the growth to happen? Um, we do have three springs, but again, it's four stories for the VOA building. Everything else is three stories. You need to do more vertical. And so when they pencil it out, the developers go, wait a minute doesn't make sense to me. 
in this, the city and the county are not running the infrastructure. They're they're forcing the builders to do that. And as you know, it's pass through cost to the end user. So mm -hmm. you're paying for all of that instead of the county. The you know it's a substantial cost sure that, that's being incurred by the builder. That's not something that they're just going to bite the bullet. So Jack, I have one other question. Mm -hmm. Do you have any good news questions on your sheet? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a, it's a Ooh. smile. Happy hour will be short. <laughs> <laughs> My greatest all the way around. I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, maybe this is good news. So one of the biggest pushbacks that we get when we talk about the economic impacts of tourism is, yeah, it creates all these jobs, but they're all low-paying jobs. So I'm sure you guys all hear that all the time. So what are some of the reasons, some of the ways you push back on that and say, um, or, or how do you how do you counter that argument um, about the all tourism all being low paying jobs? Well, I mean, you, you got to start somewhere in life, right? I mean, you know, those lower wages are generally going to people who are just getting started in the hospitality and tourism fields. Um, I can tell you right now that anybody who's on salary with us, anybody who's at the manager level, even if it's a junior manager here, is making no less than forty five thousand dollars a year. So, but in, if it's an hourly position. You know, we bring them in and then we grow them as quickly as we can. It's very important, especially for our property here, that we have um, that longevity and employment if we can. Now, of course, we have our fair share of high school students and college students that are really just here to grab that paycheck before they go on to their next thing. But we want to grow good employees here at the Strader, so we will invest in them for sure. But it's not going to start out at a you know, $50,000 a year salary or whatever that looks like for high-paying jobs. It, it makes the world go round, I think have that mix of you know all these people who make such good wages and it's not like lumber communities are creating this binary job choice of like right. it's either all high paid jobs or all low paid jobs no yeah a well diversified economy is going to have a little bit of mountain with everything you know i grew so. up in nebraska and the low paid job there was working at a meat packing plant but it paid the bills you know my job title was scraping lard <laughs> and i think i made 9.95 an hour starting and you know it's you got to start somewhere and I knew that I, that wasn't going to be a long-term career choice for me however the foreman was making over a hundred thousand dollars a year my nephew is making hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year in that same industry right now and so I think it's you know out of my 55 employees I got 10 or 12 that will make over fifty thousand dollars this this year um, and if they were able to continue on and work more throughout the year with us if we weren't as seasonal it would, it would net them even more annual salary the rest of them are entry-level jobs and I, I would kind of go back and say the question would be is what's wrong with an entry-level position what's wrong with $15 an hour starting at this point I think Colorado maybe in our market I think the last one I saw was like 1638 or 1725 is considered the, the livable wage and when you factor in the gratuity that the guides do get they're well in excess of that they're 22 24 dollars an hour in their, in their tipped wages so I don't know, I'm actually kind of proud of our, of our wage salary, and I would probably defend that by saying, uh, let's dive a little deeper, and let's look at yeah. what... Don't just assume. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would as well. I, you, look at, you look at our property, our bussers, after tips, are making around 54000 a year as a bus staff. And so, our, our, it, it, on paper, yeah, it looks like a low wage because they're making $9.58 an hour. But when you look at what they're making in tips, I was a manager making less money than half of these guys a, a few years ago. Like our bartender, our bartender at uh, 49 Lounge, he makes well over $100,000 a year as a bartender. And he I've works got four days a week. bartenders like that. <laughs> yeah. and, they make, and they work four days a week. Like, no, just because you're a bartender doesn't mean you're making very little money. They're making killer money. It, it's all perception. And what we've got to do is we've got to go out and, and change the perception. So I think so much of it too is just trying to find what makes, ask your employee, what do you want? You know, I mean, Brian's on my board and I'm, I have a board meeting tomorrow and I'm telling my board, I'm taking a four to six week sabbatical. I need a break. And it's one of those things that, you know, it's like, okay, this is, and I've talked to all my executive committee and said, look, I, I've got to take this uh, for my own mental well being. Otherwise, I'll all kind of collapsing after last year. So it's something to find out what makes the employee tick. You know, if they want to buy a house, bring in for us the homes fund, bring in Habitat for Humanity, bring in the organizations that you're partnered with and say, all right, we're going to have a class. We're going to teach that. We're going to show you how to do it. You know, or if it's, um, 
you know, child care, being creative with the employee and to find those resources to say, okay, we got to make it work. I don't know how we on time. I think some, of our, some of our staff does tap out too, right? So they're getting subsidized from other funding sources, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so they're only allowed to make a certain wage with us. So we have tried yes. to take some of those employees and elevate them, and they refuse it because they're getting income from another source that will tap them out of collecting what they need to collect. I wanted to give him $18 an hour, and he said I need to make 15 Social Security. We've, Social got Security. People, we've got people that work for us that are over 65, and they're like, no, I can only make, yeah. So, question. I think it was Dave, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> you mentioned that you cross-train all your staff for all positions. Do you pay them all the same, or how do you figure that out? Is it literally, we, literally, we have a chart. So if you're a new hire, and you're still willing to work full-time and get cross-trained, you get to we have this cumulative effect of all these things. If you follow the behavior that we're trying to create, if you're willing to do it, don't make anybody do it, but if you wanna keep adding those things together, you can increase your wage pretty significantly. But how often can they move into different positions? Basically, we ask them the first time. We don't even ask them to be fully trained before they get that cross-training premium, we call it. Um, Great, we'll get you. We'll get you trained now. Right at hiring, if you're willing to get cross trained in two other jobs other than your primary job, you will get a premium. Now, things like lift mechanics and um, you know facility maintenance techs, um, they do have very specific criteria. And whenever a facility maintenance tech gets their pool certification or their propane certification. There's a set amount that their hourly rate goes up. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, all these guys are making twenty-five to thirty-five dollars an hour now since we rolled that out. We got a little bit of a head start with that because that has been historically a challenging set of jobs within the ski industry. So we're a little ahead. We we're slowly learning. New times. Can we apply some of the stuff that seems to be working to these other jobs? And now, like I said, instead of Hiring you to be a ticket seller, you're going to learn how to sell tickets, do rentals, probably work in retail, keep those jobs together. There are certain jobs, though, you can't do these types of cross training. Like if you're a cook two or above, or you know you're a controller, you know you, you can't probably drop everything and go load a chair that day. But uh, you know some of us will. Yeah, it's great. To a question or a comment, uh, the comments first, and one of the things that we're seeing is that there are a lot of people who work at the ski area who've been with the ski area for 25, 30 years, and they figured out their housing 25, 30 years ago. And as they retire, the new people aren't going to be able to figure out their housing. So that's going to be like this big shift with in our community of like, wow, we have a ton of people who started working there in the 70s, and now they, they're at retirement age, but they're people. They're retiring in place, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to stay there. Um, but that, so that's my comment. My question is, um, one of you, probably Dave, mentioned this a lot. Yeah, I think it was you. Yeah, and uh, I talked to one of our restaurateurs, and he said, we had the best winter season we've ever had. Like, we made so much money. He's like, but I've never had a season that's been so taxing on employees. They're, they're spent, they're, they're done. And so I would just wonder if anybody has done anything to address the mental health issues that have come, you know, I think more than anything post-pandemic or, which not post-pandemic yet, in the pandemic, uh, that we're seeing with the workforce. So, you know, I will say, because we had our task force that we formed here in uh, La Plata County, and we're drawing COVID to COVID, 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 I said the mental impact is going to exceed. And I, Rachel Hervey, if you're on those calls, I, Dave Hervey say it over and over. The fatigue and everything so I um, I know we've talked about it in our staff at the chamber are you guys dealing and talking and saying hey if you need you know some uh, mental I call it mental floss every day but if you need a break or talk to someone are you guys putting that in place totally so so I'm actually on the founding board of directors for a nonprofit called in the weeds and it's just just for hospitality you know people where 
you get you work at a double and you can go between um, shifts and go hang out and just take a nap or grab a bite to eat or you know hang out and just get away from work you know for an hour before your double you can go there or they can provide you with the right resources um, they also have a uh, top shelf care self care but basically if you don't take a shift drink that day the manager signs off on your little card and you turn that in you get a fifty dollar gift card for um, uh, gas or to a restaurant or whatever. So. Oh, yeah, our like uh, our employee assistance program, which you go back go back five years ago to really see the change. Um, it's all drug and alcohol abuse. Now it's all mental health. I mean, we just had one of our overnight security guards have a really he had a breakdown, and he went on FMLA, took the full twelve weeks, used up all of his. Uh, paid time off and then some and just he can't do it anymore he can't be you know alone at night in the dark anymore he just could not take it anymore so that's just one example it has, it has really been a hardship i mean you know hotels were deemed essential for the state of colorado and so our hotel never shut down even though our occupancy was low so there was a handful of us that were here every day during that pandemic and it was we tried to find different ways of being creative to keep people on payroll. We refinished tables. We we opened up sweet dining when we were able to finally open our kitchen again, so that each of our significant historic hotel rooms became a dining room, a private dining room for you to party. Um, we adapted, and we're continuing to adapt every single day. So, you know, survival of the fittest was mentioned for sure. But I think that those of us who are willing to just come into work every day, not knowing necessarily what that day is going to bring, even if you've laid that plan out very clearly and be able to pivot and adapt every single day. I mean, there's, you know, long-term planning, that's my job, right? As a general manager, to look far down that football field, and it's, you know, while we have done that, certainly it's very challenging to stick to the course. And one thing I, I heard the other day from one of my colleagues, and uh, oh, Chris Romer up in Vail, sorry. No. Uh, <laughs> and, but he said, he goes, so how's it going? He goes, I have finally figured out 80% of what I do is not even on my calendar. Well, that just sums up what we do all day long, right? And all of us in the positions we are, you just start this way, and all of a sudden something happens, and you most overword, you, overused word, pivot, and you start having another thing. And if you're responsible for other uh, people, you know, their people are your number one uh, investment. You got to take care of them. Well, I, I told one of my managers the other day, and I said, look, 80% of your week this week needs to be employee based. You need, to, you need to grab every single one of your team members, clear your calendar. 20% busy, 80% team. And you know, we immediately saw a shift just because the water was getting low, it was so hot and dusty and dry. Like the low water blues were starting to happen in June, they usually happen until late August. Um, the rain worked. Um, but for us, we, for a small business, we hired an HR firm that helps work through employee, employee, employee related issues and mental health and EAP, um, kind of explain some of the new Colorado revisions to employment law, so it was super beneficial for us, not only for my own mental health, who tried to try to take on some of that, but now I have all of that lifted off my plate. And then for us, our sanity is multi-day raft trips, and then we took a boat out of the Zircon the other day, and we put it in the middle of our backyard and said, everybody can take the boat. So we have a fun run boat set up for anybody to go play. That's great. So. Well, we're running out of time here. Yep. Uh, Jack. Thank you so much for facilitating you guys. such a great job. The panel, thank you all. David, Dave, Tori, Dave, <laughs> <laughs> Brian, Brian, Dave, <laughs> Dave. Uh, I mean, this could have been done in front of 500 people. That's how yeah. long. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> Knowing all of them, if you guys have questions and follow up, I'm sure they'd be happy to build those on through Rachel or whoever but she can put you in contact and same thing for me. And thank you Rachel for putting it on the other great great job. Great panel. Yeah thanks guys. That was awesome. And when's happy hour? Outdoorsy at six. One minute to go. So before we take off because we are gonna allow people to check in now that it is four o'clock we people are really come to check in. Um, I think the plan is to meet at the front door at 4.30, and we're going to do a little tour of Durango.